Hi everybody, I'm Dan Wells. I write horror, fantasy, and science fiction, and I talk about games on the internet. Today, I want to talk about one of the source books for the John Carter RPG, which is the Dotar Sojet source book. Uh, there are three source books in this series. It's a trilogy, uh, essentially, of timelines uh, based on the books. The John Carter of Mars books um, have, I mean, the, the way that they divide up the timelines are first, Dotar Sojet, which is when John Carter first shows up on Mars, uh, Barsoom, and, you know, it's basically the first book called A Princess of Mars. Um, Dotar Sojet is the name that John Carter was given by the Tharks, uh, based on the first two people that he killed in their culture. And, uh, you know, by the end of it, by the end of the book, then, uh, spoiler warning for this, like, hundred-year-old book, he marries... Uh, Deja Thoris, and he becomes a Prince of Helium. And so the second book is called The Prince of Helium Era, and that covers a lot of the books, of the books in the in the John Carter series, and then uh, of the novels. And then the third book is called Je Jeddak of Jeddax, and that is the final era of play and based on the time when John Carter was kind of in charge of everything. He had risen up to be the biggest warlord and political leader on the planet, and so that's what he's doing. Anyway, each of those eras is actually very distinct. And uh, Dotar Sojet is a pretty good example of that. So uh, let's have a look. Again, no PDF today, unfortunately. We just have the physical book. But um, so when John Carter of Mars first showed up on Mars, uh, everyone hated each other. Everyone was at war with everyone else. And some of the major races of the world, including what the core book considers primary player races, uh, were hidden. Nobody knew who the firstborn were. Nobody knew who the Okar were. Uh, nobody had had contact with them for a long time. So what we get is a very distinct environment that is defined by uh, some fairly small things. First of all, uh, war. Everyone is at war with everyone else. By the time you get into Prince of Helium and, and Jeddak of Jeddaks, the Red Martians and the Green Martians, for example, had alliances. Not all of them were friendly with all of them, but they had learned to work together. When you're still in Dotar Sojat era, none of that nonsense. Everyone wants to kill everyone else. They're constantly at war. That's just how it's defined. Number two, this era of play is kind of defined by exploration because nobody had found, for example, the Okar or the Firstborn. Nobody knew what, uh, you know, the secret of the river is. There's all of these things, and so a lot of it is about discovery and exploration, things that in the core book are presented as just flat truths that everybody knows. Well, this is why everyone knows them, because in this era, they get discovered. And uh, let's see. There's a whole section that talks about this. I suppose I could be looking at it. What what else defines the era? Um, oh, tradition versus innovation. That's a good one. Um, so the people of Barsoom are incredibly hidebound. They're incredibly um, traditional. And the way things have always been done is the way that they will always be done forever. And so this idea that, you know, John Carter shows up and he changes things and he says, actually, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to, for example, be nice to my animals. And then the people that he's with see that the animals suddenly respond better and that they fight better and that they're more loyal. And they all go, oh, maybe we should be doing that too. And whether or not it makes any sense that this million-year-old culture never thought that they should be nice to their animals or not, um, it is a factor of the setting that they were bound by one tradition and were unable to really innovate anything else. And that is a primary identifying characteristic of the Dotar Sojat era of play. So anyway, that's why Dotar Sojat is different, and that's why it might be fun to play in it, is because... It has these kind of distinct elements that uh, separate it from everything else. Um, it might... Uh, one, one thing... Let's, let's level a little bit of a criticism at this book. Um, 
it is incredibly determined to stay true to the novels. And the reason that I call that a criticism is because this is a role-playing game. And so the odds that you're actually playing any of the characters from the novels are low. Um, it actually never occurred to me personally that my characters would meet, for example, John Carter himself, or Dejah Thoris, or Tars Tarkas, or any of those characters. Just as when I play the Conan RPG, my characters never meet Conan. Like, what is interesting to me, what I suspect is interesting to most of the players, is the chance to play through the world. You know, I have been playing Star Wars role-playing games since I was a little child, and never once did I have Luke Skywalker show up and do something, because my characters are the heroes. Uh, yes, maybe we will fight Darth Vader as a villain, but, you know, we're never going to, like, I don't know. Everyone's different. There's probably half of you out there are like, well, of course we met Luke Skywalker in our games. Uh, anyway, so... Back to this book, uh, they are very determined to maintain just absolute um, kind of trueness canon with the book series. And so there's a section, for example, where it talks about um, the timeline. And one of the things, one of the examples they use is uh, there is a one of the Martian cities does not have a very impressive navy. They don't have a lot of airships, and it says so. When your characters go there, you might have them influence that um, that city so that they get a much larger navy. But and then it gives a warning, and it says, but you have to be careful with this because when John Carter goes there later on in book whatever the heck it is. Um, he, the fact that they don't have a navy is an important plot point that forces him to use a little flyer instead of a great big flyer or fleet of them. Okay, I do not care. I genuinely don't care what John Carter needs to do several books from now because I'm not playing through the books. Uh, I am just trying to tell a story in a setting. And so, try. I, I think it is... I won't say it's wrong. I think that it is um, up to you whether you decide to ruin the, <laughs> the timeline or not. Uh, knowing what comes later in the Prince of Helium era or in the Jeddak of Jeddak era, there is a possibility that you will introduce something early, that you will discover something early. If you're playing through this Dotar Sojat era, and to their credit, that is what the book says, is you as a group need to, you know, you get to make your own decisions as to what's going to happen. Maybe you encounter the Okar long before John Carter did, canonically in the books, and so in your version of Barsoom, the Okar are already out and people are already friendly with them. Well, that's entirely possible. Um, I suppose it is more accurate to say that that is not even remotely a concern that I have, but I will give the book credit for recognizing that some players might have that as a concern. And so they point all these elements out and say, here's this thing, uh, you might want to keep an eye on it. Anyway, uh, they talk about, uh, you know, part of that same attitude where they're trying to stay so true to the books is that the entire first chapter of this book um, talks about the adventures John Carter has in The Princess of Mars, breaking it down chapter by chapter and almost scene by scene. Uh, again, I don't care. I don't think that that is useful information for people who are trying to play a game in Barsoom, unless they are specifically interacting with uh, John Carter himself. But maybe some players are? I don't know. Um, chapter 2 does a pretty good job of saying, here's what the, the major groups are like. The Red Martians, the Green Martians, I mean, those are the primary ones. Uh, it talks a little bit about the other groups, but, you know, if you're playing in the Dotar Sojat era, most of your conflicts are going to involve Red Martians and Green Martians, most of your stories, because that's kind of all there was, because um, everyone else was still hidden and secret. 
Uh, then it talks about uh, talks about a lot of bad guys. It has a whole section where it talks about good guys. And then we get to chapter four, which, as far as I'm concerned, is where this book gets really good. Uh, the earlier chapters I could take or leave uh, because they deal with things that are not important to me personally. But like I said, I've accepted emotionally the idea that they are important to other people. So um, there is chapter four starts with mysteries of Barsoom, okay? And this is where it gets into technology. And it talks a lot about the use of technology in Edgar Rice Burroughs' fiction. The Barsoom novels are defined by science. Um, science in, you know, ways that we today recognize as completely unscientific. Uh, but the point is, you know, whether or not the science was accurate when he was writing it in 1920, whatever, that doesn't matter. The point is that he wanted to include fantastical elements, but he didn't want it to be magic. And so everything that happens in the novels is scientific to some degree. And so there's a lot of mad scientists, there's a lot of crazy space fantasy technology, but it's all defined as technology rather than magic. And so there's a whole chapter in here about how to do that. And there's a lot of really neat devices and technologies that you can include in your campaign if you want. You know, it talks about the purpose of technology. It talks about all of these things. And then it gives a bunch of new powers. Um, and these are kind of specifically designed as kind of homages to the other pulp heroes of the time when Edgar Rice Burroughs was writing. So, for example, there are powers in here like Cloud Minds. That's clearly just taken from the shadow. Beast Form. That's the Phantom. Uh, there's a lot of old school pulp hero stuff that's not part of Barsoom, but there are rules for it in here if you want it, which I think is really neat. Uh, there's a whole section on uh, esoteric martial arts. There's a whole section on telekinesis. Um, there's all this neat stuff. Okay, then next chapter talks about places. Uh, and th this is really valuable because if you're playing in the Dotar Sojat era, then the landscape itself is going to be different, which is not to say that the, the planet was, you know, physically altered uh, in the later eras, but just that, you know, w when you're talking about the, the, the world, the way that the cultures lived in the world and interacted with the world changed over time. And so, you know, here we talk about, uh, there's one that talks about the land itself, canals, hills and mountains, dry ocean basins. Uh, then there's unknown vistas, where it talks about maybe the past. If you want to play before, you know, maybe thousands of years before John Carter shows up, back when Mars was still a paradise and it had running water and it had uh, orchards and flowers and seas and stuff. Then it talks about uh, specific locations from the Princess of Mars book, like the ruined city of Korad, or uh, the green Martian incubators, the atmosphere plant, the dungeons of Warhoon, all of these really neat story elements that you can throw in. And then it has, it talks a little bit about, you know, how to make your story feel like Barsoom. Uh, you know, how do you use the sense of longing that's in the book? How do you mirror or create the sense of uh, loneliness that comes up in large parts of the book? Then it has other sections that are not from the book, but hooray! We get to, you know, expand past this uh, obsession with canon, just like we did with the new powers, and then here's a bunch of new locations. So, you know, maybe there is a sea full of ruined ships. You know, all the seas on Barsoom have dried up at this point. So there's probably a lot of old sailing ships that are down at the bottom of those dry seabeds. What are those like? How can we interact with them? That information is in here, and it's great. There's a section on how to narrate the Dotar Sojat era, which is where it talks about those kind of major touchstones I was mentioning earlier, like uh, discovery, tradition versus innovation, that sort of thing. Um, it talks about why you would play in the Dotar Sojat era. Why pick this one rather than Prince of Helium or Jeddak of Jeddak? What is it going to do? And then it talks about specific adventures and campaigns set in this era. And again, it is a little more obsessed with canon than I think is necessary in terms of 
what it suggests that you can and cannot do. However, that said, it is an incredibly, incredibly great section. So, for example, it has all of these adventure seeds. So here's one called Mooncrossed Lovers, one called The Apes Among Us, and it gives for every one of them who are the kinds of characters that will be involved in this. What are different, you know, what, what is the story hook? And then for every one of them, three or four variations. So if you want to play The Apes Among Us, it gives, you know, a big chunk, three big paragraphs about what this story is about. And then four extra paragraphs saying, actually, you could tweak it and go in this direction, or you could tweak it and go in this other direction. And there are just pages and pages of these adventure seeds, uh, which I find to be just incredibly cool. This this company, this game line, has published a campaign book called Phantoms of Mars. This section in this book that has adventure seeds, I think, is even more useful than that campaign book in terms of telling stories and uh, designing adventures for your characters in Barsoom. So, really great stuff. There's another section talking about events, regional events, world events. How are those going to work? It's all awesome. And then last of all, we come to a chapter about airships. There are airships included in the core book because airships are a vital part of the setting. Uh, but this book, Dotar Sojet era, expands that with a massive chapter that explains so much more. Uh, and uh, kind of what they're doing is they're taking the very abstract airships of the core book and combining them sort of with a modified version of the Star Trek ship rules. So there's a lot more detail, there's a lot more variation, uh, there's a lot more that you can do when you get into, say, an airship battle. How are you going to make this work? Well, here's an example of how you can make this work. The game is filled with, uh, or this chapter rather, is filled with rules for constructing your own airship, ways to personalize those airships, it has a bunch of, you know, specific kind of, um, I shouldn't say specific, there are generic airship designs that you can use. And then there's a handful of specific airships, of actual airships with names and histories and, uh, you know, crews that you can use to throw into your stories. The airship section, mechanically speaking, might be the single most valuable part of this book. Uh, and whether or not you're going to play in the Dotar Sojat era, it is probably worth it to pick this book up just to get the expanded airship rules because they are so good and they are so complete. Uh, and, you know, they don't add a ton of extra complexity either, which is nice. The game still plays very smoothly. It is still overall, I think, a relatively um, abstract, streamlined game. Um, but these extra airship rules do give you a lot more options and a lot more actions and a lot more things that you can do. So, anyway, John Carter of Mars, the Dotar Sojat era. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting book. It has some good parts. It has some bad parts. Overall, I do think, even if it's for the airships alone, it is worth your time and trouble to get. But on top of that, it has that incredible section on new powers, uh, inspired by old pulp stories. It has that great section on technology and mad science and all of that. And then it has, you know, one of the best adventure seed sections that uh, I've seen in this entire game line. In fact, thus far, the best <laughs> that John Carter has to offer uh, in terms of how to put together adventures and tell these stories. So, if you want to play John Carter, I do recommend you pick this book up. And if you don't want to play John Carter, go read some John Carter books, and then you will want to play John Carter, because it is a really wonderful series, wonderful setting. I dig it. Anyway, thanks for watching my show. I am delighted to spend this time with you, and I will see you on my next review. Bye.